Oh, let me switch cameras because it'll look better. Oh yeah. I have another camera here somewhere. I think it's on the floor. That's the best place for it. Ouch. And then I hit the microphone because that's always great. <laughs> I don't have my mental health worry. It's okay. You're going to be okay. We just have to get through the next. Well, actually, I can't even say that because it might get worse. Who knows? Yeah, nobody knows anything for the rest of the day. Yeah. Give us All a right, break. All right. I'm good when you are. Okay. Is my audio okay? Yeah. Actually, hold on one second. Did you yeah. hear that? Okay. Yep. It's the right thing then. Cool. Just make it sure. Okay. Let's do this. All right. I'm going to check the date because I'm like that. It is Friday, June 28, 2019. I'm Renee Ritchie, and right now we're going to talk all about Johnny Ive leaving the building that he spent the last five years designing because this <laughs> is the I'm More Show. Joining me this week, I am ecstatic to have the one, the only, Lori Gill. How are you, Lori? I am kind of blown out of my mind at the moment. Just things have just been crazy this week. And I think we all know what the this biggest month, this year. <laughs> <laughs> so Georgia is on vacation. She's camping, I believe, in the wilderness of Kronos, the Klingon home world. She won't <laughs> confirm or deny that, but she did take both a tent and a phaser rifle. So that's what I expect. And my mind got blown off the internet. I don't know if she was the cause, though. We have no proof yet, but I guess we'll find out next week with the lawyers and all. Yeah, right. <laughs> How are you doing, Lori? A little, little bit busy lately? Good. Uh, you know, it's it's been a crazy week. It's a lot happened this week, and not just the the big news with um with our our the the big change up at Apple that we're about to discuss. But there's also been some really big things happen. The um, betas dropped. The public betas dropped. So there was a lot of a lot what of did discussion you want to do about first? that. Oh, you know, it, we've already talked about developer beta, so we shouldn't spend okay. a bunch of time on it. But what I'd like to do is run through it again real quick, some of the cool features. Now that more people have access to it, I especially want to talk about Sidecar because I think a lot of people are excited about that one. So we should definitely. And maybe we should, maybe we should start off by just who should install this, Lori, and who should stay the hell away? So the public betas are available to anybody. So yes. You, me, my mom, anybody can download and install the public betas. And that is where the danger lies, is that you shouldn't. <laughs> you just shouldn't. Yeah. Unless the default is shouldn't, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Like nobody should is is number yeah. one. And number two is if you are a a go-getter and you're super excited and you want to test out the new features and are just you got your FOMO and you can't wait until the fall. Don't do it on your daily devices. Yeah, Don't do it yeah. on the only iPhone you have or the only iPod, uh, iPad you have or iPod Something you that have. your safety and the safety of your family and friends depend on. Yes, because even though it's a public beta and it's also so that so it's more reliable than the developer beta, yeah. there's still going to be problems. There's still going to be your favorite apps that you use every day. Some of them just won't work. And you can't, there's nothing you can do about that. It's not Apple's fault and it's not that developer's fault. It's still in beta. So things are just not going to be all up to date just yet. So, you know, if you use, you know, some some productivity app for work and you install the new um, Catalina on your Mac and then you can't use that developer beta or that that uh, developer, that that app that you're that productivity productivity app, that's kind of your fault that you can't use it. So if you don't have a second device, um, don't don't down in download, install it on your um, mobile devices. You can partition your Mac and put it on your second your your partitioned Mac, it it's it doesn't mess with your main drive yeah. if you do that. So that's an option. But again, these are all, you know, be careful. Don't don't jump into something unnecessarily. Um, it's all coming out in the fall and it's all going to be in a much better format in the fall. There's not going to be as many issues with apps that don't um, work also, with it or I was just going to say also I did a video on Mac OS Catalina and it's an hour long. Nobody nobody should watch it. But Everybody should even watch if it. it. <laughs> even if it had been five minutes long, I toyed with the idea of editing it on a Mac with OS X Catalina. And it just it would not have worked. Not because, you know, there's any inherent, it's just, it's so beta and Final Cut is so demanding. And I just, I couldn't, usually I wait a year. I, I, I Only when um, 
only when I think like a few weeks ago, I put Mojave on my machine that I use Final Cut Pro on. So I'm like a year <laughs> behind that yeah. on yeah. that because I, it, it just has to be stable. Like if I can't work, I can't work. So mm -hmm. there was, I flirted with the idea for maybe 30 seconds. And then I saw a bunch of people I trust go, mm, no, no. Not yet, not yet. Yeah, it warned me off. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> okay, so yeah. on my main machine, I'm not running, I have it running on a secondary machine, but on my main machine, I'm not running Catalina. So that's, you know, from Renee's mouth there too. Like he's, <laughs> He's even suggesting don't even, don't risk it, don't risk it. That's so, you know, just like me, I, I only have the, de the developer or public betas on a second or third device, nothing on my my main or dailies. Cause I know better, that's just, you know, you're you're putting your own personal uh, device safety at risk by, yep. by jumping into betas too early. So it's definitely something that isn't for everyone. It's all gonna be out again, be out in the fall. Um, it's also, if you're, if you're testing, a public beta, it's probably really important for you to understand that it, don't just jump on Twitter and say Apple broke everything. If you see something that you don't like, or if there seems to be a glitch in something, file file a feedback um, through the feedback assistant app because yeah. these are these are betas. So your your rantings and ravings about how Apple broke things are sort of not really relevant until it's out in the fall. And then you can publicly rant and rave about what Apple broke. But for now, just send things directly to Apple through the Feedback Assistant app. Yep. And if enough people complain that some, some uh, service or feature that they love isn't in you know the iPhone on the iPhone or iPad or on the Mac, they'll take that into consideration and possibly completely change that and bring that feature back. So that's the best way to do it, not ranting on Twitter. So let me just put that out there. It doesn't help Apple. It doesn't help you to talk about what's wrong with the betas on Twitter unless you have also submitted feedback to, to Apple directly. So do that too. Yeah, if, if they don't update, like for example, Google is infamous for not updating stuff in a timely fashion, even though they have months months to get it ready then you can you know after the release comes out you can go after them on twitter to your heart's content but right. until then developers cannot actually they're not allowed to update they can fix things that are wrong with the current sdk the ios 12 one or the mac os mojave one but they're not allowed to submit binaries built on the new operating systems yet so if it's something that they need that for they literally cannot fix it so don't be mean to them yeah they're working hard on their end so <laughs> be excellent to each other so um Let's quickly yeah, just talk about. You wanted to talk sidecar. Yeah, it's. I think it really, in my in my opinion, it makes. You know, we we hear a lot about the talk of like, is the iPad, you know, ever going to be a computer replacement? You sidecar obviously doesn't make it a computer replacement because you need a computer to use it, but the computer it's has certainly, to be the car that you're sided to. Yeah, it certainly <laughs> does make your iPad so much more like a computer. It's incredible. It makes it a second screen. It's it's amazing to have that that portable um, extra screen space. And um, I know that we've talked about this many times on many different shows about how there there are currently apps and even hardware that allow you to turn your iPad into a second screen. Uh, Luna Display is um, the hardware. Um, you just plug it into your uh, MacBook Pro or, or Mac or any of Even your laptops. Even like VNC or remote desktop will do it for you. Right. So yeah. So those are like the Luna Display is like the hardware that allows yeah. you to have like a wireless connection. And then there's a bunch of apps that will either give you um, wireless connection or you can even have wired connection. Duet Display is one of the apps that requires a wired connection but actually has um, less lag time. So it, it's more stable and reliable than some of the other apps that use uh, wireless connection. Um, so I definitely don't want to say that, you know, oh, this is brand new and it's never been done before, but it's so seamless that yeah. it, it, it's it, all you have to do is be running Mac OS Catalina and iPad OS 13. And it's just there. Your, your iPad is just already able to be connected as a second screen. You just click on that little um, screen mirroring drop-down icon. That's the name that we would recognize it as. It's up in your menu bar and you click on that. And instead of selecting you know, your Apple TV or some other thing that you would mirror to, you would select your iPad. And then you can select whether you wanna mirror it or whether you want to use it as a second screen. Obviously I would use it as a second screen because that's where the fun comes in. And then bam, you're just connected. You can drag things over from your Mac screen to the iPad screen, you know, your chat apps, 
um, a movie, anything you want just pops over. And because it's used, it's tied into the Apple software. So it's tied into your software system. It works better than any way I've ever used it, um, especially when it comes to things like um, watching a movie or or a, or a video game like running that runs with a lot of graphics. It, it's crazy how yeah. how well it works between Mac and iOS or iPad OS um, using the Apple internal system. So it's pretty it's incredible. It's cool because they're using, if you have, a, like obviously every iPad has an A series chip in it, which has the, the last few generations have got these custom encode blocks on those chips that do H.265, encode decode, but the Apple T2 chips inside some of the Macs also, they're basically A series chips that have been retasked and they have those custom encode decode blocks. And so they also do hardware accelerated H.265. And when you, when both, it works regardless of which iPad or which Mac you have. So if you have an older iPad and you have an older Mac, not a problem, but if you have those blocks, man, does it just fly. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty exciting. So uh, the, for those of you who are um, being smart and waiting until the fall, get ready for Sidecar. That's going to be pretty awesome. Um, have you, have have you, you used been... it with any apps yet? Oh, yeah. Lots of different apps. I haven't, used it with the, I haven't used it with any drawing apps because I can't draw. That's all <laughs> so I've done, I, actually. That's all I've done. <laughs> that, I want you to talk about that because um, okay. to point that out, um, when your Mac apps are on your iPad screen, the uh, or or even when it's not even if it's just the desktop your apple pencil works on your ipad screen and triggers like a pointer or or like your mouse yeah. in a way um so for one thing you can like click and double click like you were using a mouse but it's on your ipad screen using your apple pencil but you can also draw things um that would if if it were if it supported like a you know a a, a touchpad or a yeah. mouse the Apple Pencil does that instead, so it allows you to draw. So, Renee, you've actually experienced it. So, what it, what is that like? Like, what you um, talk about an app that you've used, and then the experience you've had. So, I just gotta say, it really is beta. You can feel it because sometimes it is pinpoint accurate, and sometimes it's where I was a second ago, and it's all like beta things that have to come over. But the thing I love is that Apple made it quote unquote just work. So, anything that supports a Wacom tablet which I used for like a decade when I worked in design, just works with the Apple Pencil and the iPad. And that there are so many apps that are enabled, like just not even just Photoshop, but Final Cut Pro, Motion, Maya, Illustrator, like all the apps you're used to, you can just use them with Sidecar. And I like it so much better because there's no air gap, there's no reticule, it, it, the response rate is so great. So I used it with Photoshop. I used it with Final Cut, but I didn't really see much point because Final Cut to me has always been a trackpad sort of app. Um, and then I also used it with like Apple's built-in stuff, but with the built-in stuff, I feel like I can just do that directly on the iPad. So that's not quite as revolutionary, but the minute you're doing full on Photoshop with a pencil, like it feels to me like I'm I'm like using a next generation, never released Wacom tablet. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the, the story that I keep hearing is that it feels like you're using a Wacom tablet. So yeah. that's pretty cool. Yeah, I no, like I'm it. seriously like, I would marry it if it was legal in my province. <laughs> Yeah, I'm in love with Sidecar for sure. Yeah. There's a lot of other super great features, um, but we've we've already talked about them when the developer betas came out, so we yeah. don't need to go into too much detail. Obviously, um, dark mode is a, a big deal that I'm sure people are very excited about. It's funny. Using it? been, That's the thing is like everybody wants it, but then everyone's like, ah, it's kind of oppressive. I'm not going to use Are you using it? I use it. I actually think okay. it's great. Um, I, I love the dynamic one. I love you know, that it switches over That's at nighttime. And so Yeah. Um, because I do find but, it depressing during the day, but I find it so soothing at night. I guess I don't find it, like, it doesn't affect my mental state. I okay. enjoy like, just like my my computer, my Mac, I like that thing, like things just look different suddenly. It's like kind of a pleasant um, experience to have your theme just change completely for a little while. Is Safari so. confusing you? Because like for me, I got so used to dark, because I keep Safari in private browsing mode a lot because I just don't, I don't need records of where I go on the internet. Um, and now when you, when the normal dark mode looks like the old private mode and the private mode has this huge amount of text saying, no, no, now you're actually in private mode. And I get confused <laughs> every time. I haven't had that experience. I don't actually work okay. in private mode, but um I think, yeah, no, I think it looks good. I think actually some of the things that get a little, I, that throw me off a little are apps that have always had dark mode, Yeah. Um, that I have dark mode sort of on 
And then when I'm when I'm in light mode, but those things are still in dark mode, I'm like, why is that still in dark mode? Oh, that's right. Yep. I'm actually just using the app in dark mode. <laughs> yeah, no, I feel you, Lori. I feel you. <laughs> Um, have you, I actually have not installed a developer or public beta of tvOS, but I think you have, right? No, I haven't. You know, I keep meaning to do it. And then so much news keeps happening that I haven't had time yet. I'm <laughs> yeah. running every other beta because every other beta is like, I don't even think about it. I just, I put the iOS one on and then it puts the watch one on. And But tvOS, does, you have to like think about it separately. Yeah. And I, I only have one Apple TV. So okay. I don't want to install it on that because th I mean, that's how I watch all of my shows and movies and things like that. So the idea of, you know, accidentally messing it up or even just having to uh, like re uh, sign up for things or sign into things. I like, I'm not sure how smooth that process is. Yeah. So I haven't even tried it on Apple TV yet, which by the way, everybody who's listening, Remember, if you don't have a second device, you should probably avoid it. Speaking from experience, just don't do it. I don't do it, so you shouldn't don't do, do it. it. Don't do it. <laughs> I might have to go buy myself a second Apple TV, though. Pull up, pull up. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm totally um, with you on that. Yeah, it's uh, it's just you know too important to make that kind of mistake. Yeah. So yeah, big deal with the the betas, and if if all goes. As, as it usually does, where we get the regular updates, um, maybe early July, we might see a second beta. Um, a lot of these right now are probably going to be really minor changes, though. We're yeah. not probably going to see um, big new features coming in or, or other features co going away. Um, I'm excited though, uh, you know, Apple Card, I'm kind of switching gears right now, less about beta, more about a new feature coming soon. Apple Card is coming this summer, right? So oh, it's is that this an American summer. thing? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> okay. I'm very excited about it. Um, because it's it's gotta be coming soon-ish, you know. The summer is officially here and it officially won't be my, many more months before it's over. So um I know you probably don't have a lot to to say about it, but I'm pretty excited I want about it. it. Is um, that okay? It you you it's okay that you want it, but I'm sorry that you can't have it. <laughs> you can't have no. <laughs> um, no, but the, I mean, the simple truth is for people who wonder like why stuff is US only, because there's a whole bunch of people outside the US that sometimes feel like second class Apple citizens because they don't get the features. And if they do get them, it usually takes longer and there's less things in them. Like even Apple TV channels, America has like 20 and the rest of the world has like two or three. Um, it's easier for Apple to strike deals in the US because they're based in the US, but also the US has an incredibly competitive market. Uh, and the banks, like it, just like a uh, singular was so desperate to get the iPhone. They said Apple could do anything they want. Just please God, give us the iPhone. It's the same thing now with Goldman Sachs. Like, please God, do whatever you want with this credit card. Just let us work with you. We're in like Canada, Australia, and a lot of other countries, there are very few banks. Some of them are federally chartered and they have no real incentive to compete. So it'll take much longer for Apple to find someone desperate or forward thinking enough to do it with them. Yep. Yeah. I, and you, you'll you get there. I, you know, <laughs> like I know it's sad, but like Apple News took quite a while for you to finally like get it. Five years. Yeah. And but that was, it, yeah, the rest of the world. But to me, that that's evidence that Apple is trying. So it, you know, yeah. Apple doesn't just go, oh, eh, Canada. They're out there doing what they can to make sure that it becomes available to you. You, you know, there's a lot of hoops to jump through, and Apple jumps through them. It just they do go like uh -huh, Latveria, screw that Doctor Doom guy. But Canada and the rest of the world, they're happy to work with. Yeah, exactly. So it's good. Um, we actually got exclusive pictures of Ooh. the Apple card. Um, one of our sources at Mobile Nations has a source and it's not you, Renee, in case anybody's no. wondering. <laughs> yeah, I'm but, like the last uh, person getting an Apple card. And uh, uh, I think some people, when when I talk about our secret sources, they think that it's you who has the secret source, but this yeah, time no. around it wasn't you. <laughs> nope. Um, so we we got some pictures of it of what it looks like on the front and back and what the card looks like the the sleeve that it comes in looks like and um a really interesting thing um the person that took the pictures actually weighed it so we know that the titanium apple card weighs 14.75 grams so that's kind of cool it's all white it has beautiful let's see if i remember debossed because embossed i think means that it 
pushes outward and debossed means it pushes inward. We had one of our readers uh, correct me on that. So the card oh, is debossed <laughs> in order to, um, so it has the Apple logo on the front and then the person's name. And on the back side, it actually says Goldman Sachs and then the MasterCard logo. And the magnetic strip is just this solid gray. So it it's very streamlined and sleek and, and uh, it's pretty cool looking. And I'm excited about it. I wasn't even too excited about it before because I don't need another credit card. But yeah. looking at the uh, the way that Apple but is it card lower interest actually, rate, maybe Lori. Like I, I pay my yeah, balance fact, every month because I'm petrified of having any debt because I know it'll end up in debtor's prison. It's like from reading <laughs> books of like the ancient British Victorian era. Like I never want to end up in debtor's prison, so I pay my card like every month. Like I'm like <laughs> like a predator is in orbit waiting for me not to. But for people who don't, the the interest rate is about as low as you can get. And I have to confess. When Lori and I were at WWDC, because Apple Retail didn't have them then, but Apple Incorporated had them. If you looked around the bars, you could see a couple of them sort of surreptitiously on the table somewhere. And man, were they shiny! Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty cool again. I um, so something else that we did learn from from um, our source, uh, there there are pe people that are being approved. Let's see if the exact wording here. Um, the, our source told us that one person um, who had a low credit score that was between six and 700 was approved, but their credit limit was lower. It was only a thousand dollars. So for people who, this is something that I brought up on um, Mac break weekly too. I, I really appreciate this when I was brand new in the world of credit, I didn't have a credit card and I didn't know how to get one. I had no, no credit history. Um, yeah, if you're not in debt, I wouldn't want to give you debt. It's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, I went and got myself, I don't even remember what it was now. It might've been a Sears card or something like that because I had heard that um, that was a, a company that gives people with no credit, it gives them yeah. a chance to get started. And I loved that. I had a really high interest rate though. I, I barely used it and I paid it off right away once I got real credit and could actually apply for a better, a better interest rate credit card. So Apple doing this, Apple, um, approving people that have low or no credit scores is ex to me it's exactly what they're hoping to do which is yeah. help people build credit help people fix their bad credit um you know with the the um the extra features that come in the wallet app that help you watch your budget and easily pay off the credit card this is a way for you to rebuild your bad credit or it's a way for somebody who doesn't have credit to start building credit so i think it's great that they decided to do that instead of making it exclusive and only for people who have really good credit scores. I think, yeah. <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> I think um, years ago I applied for a credit card, um, a Barclays credit card at an Apple store and wasn't approved for it, even though my credit at the time was pretty good. It wasn't great, but it was pretty good. And I remember being surprised that I, I wasn't approved for it. And I think it was one of those sort of like, you had to have really good credit if you wanted to get this credit card, this Barclays card at, you know, at Apple. Like it was, I was at the retail store applying for it. So this seems like it's a little more inclusive to a lot of different people. So it's good. Yeah, no, yeah. Uh, and I forget who, someone had a really good, I think it was Ben Thompson had a really good article on it where he was explaining that a lot of people, and it is, it's usurious, it's a horrible business, it keeps people in debt. But there's there's nothing else financing it. When you mortgage your house, the bank can take your house if you don't make a payment. If you finance your car, the bank can take your car if you don't make a payment. But there's no mechanism for like for that with credit cards. Like they come and take your credit card back. That doesn't give them their money back. So mm -hmm. they hedge people who default based on charging um, higher interest rates to build up the cat. And obviously they make billions of dollars. They they charge more than they need to. But that's sort of like built into the cost of having a credit card. So by having a low credit card they're putting more of that money into the fund that pays for defaults and less of it into just the corporate greed bit. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure there's plenty of corporate greed going on. Oh, like this. Yeah, no corporation is not greedy, Lori. Yeah, Zero. and and to, to talk about this credit card as being some sort of great thing, like I do have to put myself in check, which is it's a credit card. And yeah. there is a credit card company that is behind this thing that is making money off of it, even if they're not making that much or... You know, like I think there's all the the talk that other credit card companies turned Apple down for this because it wasn't profitable enough. And like yeah, City, I think, right? 
I think that was it. Yeah. And, and the, it's a credit card company making money off of my debt. So, you yeah. know, that's true. It's definitely something to remember. So, yeah, no, absolutely. So, um, let's move yeah, Anything on. else happening? <laughs> I mean, yeah. So let's, yeah, let's move on to the biggest news of the, of the past three decades <laughs> Yeah, or the biggest news of the past decade or so the biggest least. news since the passing of steve jobs probably yeah. in terms of apple itself so tell me what happened yesterday so yesterday apple put out uh, a release saying that johnny ive sir jonathan ive if you live in a country like mine that allows knighthood um was going to be slowly easing his way out of apple over the next six uh, months or so and leaving to start his own company called love from along with mark newsom who'd been working with him at apple but that uh, from first and one of their primary clients is going to be Apple Incorporated. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and it, also just to get all the other news out of the way, Evans Han uh, Hankey, um, she's awesome. She's going to be taking over as, she's already vice president of industrial design. Uh, Alan Dye, who's been doing inter human interface at Apple since iOS 7, basically since uh, Greg Christie and Scott Forstall left. Uh, he's, he's still vice president of, human interface, but they're going to be reporting into Jeff Williams now, which I think threw a lot of people for a loop. So we we can break this down in several ways. We can talk about Johnny first and then the future of Apple next. Does that work? That sounds good. Yeah. Let's do it like that. <laughs> so I'm interested in your take because I've been talking about it a lot, but my quick take is that Johnny is like Ramses in this situation. You know, he looked upon the breadth of his empire and he wept for there were no worlds left to conquer. <laughs> like he'd been there, designed that. Uh, almost everything at Apple, consumer electronics, he designed. And since so many companies uh, were influenced by Apple, he's like sort of been the unofficial designer for modern um, consumer electronics. And he he did manage to try new things, like he did Apple Park and he did Apple Retail, and that was very architectural. And you know, he designed all the things and he designed all the places to put the things in. And I think he's just interested in new challenges. Like maybe he wants to do a lawn chair. Maybe he wants to do um, a, a little UFO ship. He may, there's probably things that he's itching as a creative person to design that just wouldn't make sense inside Apple. And so he can go to um, Love From and do those things and also consult with Apple when needed. And you know, maybe he won't. Some people are super like dubious that he'll actually be involved going forward. This is more like just to reassure people. But you know, it lets his company start off with a huge client, which gives it a lot of foundation. It means that people won't speculate that like Samsung or Google will try to bid for his services because obviously there'll be non-compete clauses in the same exact industry that Apple's in. Uh, and also sort of like for Apple, he gets to stay in the family, which is emotionally important for a lot of the people who spent the last 30 days, 30 years with him. So I think just from that point of view, it's it comes off to me as a as you know, it's an end of an era, but it's sort of a win-win way out of out of that era and into the next. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, <clears throat> I guess like one important thing to to comment on is his role, Johnny's role at Apple, and how important it was. Uh, you know, he the the iPhone looks the way it does now, the iPad looks the way it does now, because of his design aesthetic. Um, so. Everything about Apple has a very specific minimalist look. And honestly, a lot of retail stores that exist today yeah. take from that same simple, clean design element uh, that that he that he championed, that he not started, but he kind of made it the most popular thing for us to to see in the world. So it's his role at Apple has absolutely been pivotal and important and undeniably he's the genius behind the look, right? Yeah. Um, but I think we're, we're, it, 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 it does a disservice to Apple as a company to assume that the company isn't going to continue to make the best design, best looking, products around for one thing he he established that that sort of um culture in apple from the beginning people who go to work there their personal lives 
are they're surrounded by that kind of aesthetic. Yeah, he's, like their so, he's like their parents. Yeah, yeah. So they've learned that kind of culture too. I think um, there's just there's been a lot of um, talk on the internet about like how everything's going to change because he's not there in charge. He's not the the single genius in charge, and how this sort of like um, uh, sort of like uh, committee style design is going to ruin things in the future. And I don't think that's true. I think that the the company ha has established itself as this having this particular design aesthetic. And this one person is wasn't, you know, knocking on everybody's door saying, you better make sure you make it look like the way I want it to look. He started it, he grew it, and everybody that works there understands it. And it's been 30 years. And I think between the, you know, it, as a company grows from 30 years, like by today, they all know what that aesthetic is and, and they all have proud. it. And they're proud and they yeah. have, they have something to look forward to, to grow with. And, and if, if the design aesthetic changes in the next 10, 15 years, it's going to be a continuation of what already is. This is the foundation for what will change. And frankly, I don't, I don't want my phone 10 years from now to be so retro <laughs> i want it to grow with design the way design grows too so you know if if um if we were to use johnny ive as this sort of um mainstay of what apple products should look like we're stuck in the past and and this is a way for the company to grow going forward too so he gets to grow grow, grow going forward in his career path and and he gets to expand on what kind of design elements he wants to take into the future, but the company also gets to grow outside of his design aesthetic. And I think I I look forward to the kind of design aesthetic that Apple grows into, um, having you know a different group of people kind of taking control of what should or shouldn't happen in, in the design aesthetic of, of our devices and things like that. Yeah, and, and just to, to, that's a beautiful segue because <laughs> Uh, some people were nervous about Jeff Williams being put in charge of all of this, but he has been in charge of Apple Watch as a product for the since since it since before it launched since it's been in development. <laughs> and I'll always remember talking to someone who worked for Tim Cook saying, you know, at a certain point, Steve Jobs said, "Tim, you got to go and do marketing," and <laughs> and Tim's like, "I don't want to," and he's like, "No, because you've got to know how to run this company." And I think it was very similar with Jeff. You know, he had to learn how to run Apple, not just operations. But I think he delivered. He had a he had an acumen for it, and he de he developed the taste for it. And he's super interested. And Johnny said that he collaborates a lot with Jeff. And when you talk to Jeff, he doesn't talk to you about logistics and supply chain. At least not in my experience. He's very focused, very detail oriented on the and the experience. But not just from an industrial design point of view or a human interface point of view. But because he's also in charge of health, I've always found he cares deeply about the human experience, the privacy design, the expectations for how something should work. And that's all interconnected with the physical and the software design. And maybe it won't always be Jeff Williams, like maybe you know a month, a year, two years from now, they'll say Apple has hired or Apple has promoted this person to senior vice president of design. But for now, I think it, it gives a very clear path for... Um, uh, for Evans Hanke, who again has been running industrial design for years now really well, and Alan Dye, who's been running human interface really well, to sort of go back to being those teams and have Jeff involved, but they're not completely interconnected. So it's almost like a step back to the Steve Jobs era. Uh, but like you said, moving forward with fresh new ideas and fresh new talent. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I uh, I think let's let's use the Siri remote as an example, <laughs> and I'm not going to assume you that can hear you I, right over here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to assume that Johnny, I've actually designed that remote, and I'm not going to assume that um, anybody would do it different if he was the one that designed it. But that's that's an example of, and this is coming from someone like I think that that remote is just fine. I don't think there's anything wrong with it, but a lot of people complain about it. So somebody with experience in human interface and, and um, industrial design might have come up with and might in our near future come up with a remote that everybody loves, something that is more ergonomic in your hand. And maybe it doesn't have a minimalist design aesthetic, but it's just a remote. So it's okay that it doesn't you know, look perfect. 
maybe maybe the new Apple TV box will have a complete. Maybe it'll look like a little spaceship, or or maybe it'll look like the mouse, the the Apple Magic Mouse. You know, these yeah. are these are things like we we can like it can expand to a bunch of different things with different people collaborating on design. I think this is a great a great way to sort of see what kind of future comes from from having multiple people in charge of making sure that Apple design looks this certain way. Yeah, no, I think that's really, really apt. And I think that um, because uh, I keep my, <laughs> I, Evans, I keep thinking of Evans as the last name, but it's yeah. the first name. So I have to make sure I yeah. get that right. Uh, right. Because she's proven really good at managing that team. Originally, Richard yes. Howard was uh, put in charge of design when Johnny went to do the Apple Park and he reported to Tim Cook, but he really wanted to be a designer. So, you know, he was very intimately involved with the iPhone 10, for example. But Evan seems to really just want to manage that team and seems to be doing a really good, like uh, May Lee on Twitter, who used to work with, not on the team, but with the team, said that she would just get shit done. You know, that was her thing. Uh, and that I think is Apple as their products have matured and they do so many products now, more than just the Mac, more than just the Mac and the iPod. There's just so many things now that, and people are going to hate me for saying this, but I think design has to be a little bit operational. And so I, I'm an optimist by nature. I'm super optimistic. And ultimately for me, the only thing that like right now we can speculate, we can say it's a good move, it's a bad move, but the only thing that's going to matter to me is what they ship. So if the new MacBook Pro ships and the keyboard is fantastic, that's going to be a huge plus for me. If there is, and like you said, a new Siri remote, if uh, the iPhone, maybe not this year's, but next year's, you know, it, it's a radical improvement. I think they're going to deserve a huge amount of credit for that. At this point, I'm I'm going to assume that just because Johnny, I've spent so much time designing Apple Park, that even devices that are coming out this year, he probably didn't really have much to do with, you know, being in charge of that. You know, he was so still being, like I know people were still presenting to him, and he probably still had a lot of sign off on them, but he probably didn't have the day to day involvement that you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, we can maybe even um, attribute some of the changes in design and and such this year to to some yeah. things. Maybe. I mean, who knows? Maybe the Mac Pro. Actually, he probably had a pretty strong hand in how the Mac Pro was designed. Now that I think about it. <laughs> Um, yeah, so yeah, I'm looking forward to to what we have in in our near future and uh, how that's gonna how that's gonna play out. And and you're totally right. It's it, we're not gonna know yeah. what is gonna happen until it's already happening. And to speculate on the changes in Apple, um, you know, we it's fun to talk about, but it's important to remember that you know you it it's it feels like. Um, and, and and not to bring up such a, a sad subject, but it does feel like the way it felt when Steve Jobs passed away and there was this sort of sense of what's happening to the company, what's going to happen yeah. to the company. Who's this Tim Cook guy? What's well, he going to so, so the thing, the conundrum is that you can't say that they aren't important because then you say that Apple, that Apple's success would have happened without them. And you can't say that. But Apple's also a huge company and they can't be critical because part of their job is to make sure that Apple can outlive them. Part of the of the, the most important product that Steve and John and everybody else designs every day is Apple. And it's like e eventually everybody is going to leave. There will be a day when anybody you can name an Apple won't be there anymore. And for Apple to survive, they have to have built it in such a way that it can survive them. Do you know what Love Form or Love From is? What what type of company it is? Just a design company. Like I don't know how it's going okay. to be structured because you know Johnny hasn't been an independent designer for thirty years. But like before Johnny Ive, Apple used Frog Design. A lot of the early um, uh, Apple stuff, the stuff we consider iconic now, was in collaboration with Frog Design. And Steve Jobs had legendary collaborations with Chiat Day on advertising. You know, some of the biggest commercials we remember from them were at, with Steve Jobs collaborating with outside sources. So people who say like Apple would never, you know, once you leave Apple, you leave. No. Uh, you, um, they only they only stopped using external design because of Johnny Ive, and now if they go back to using it, it'll be because because that's where Johnny Ive is. So yeah. I don't think we can speak in absolutes, but um, so I, I again, this is absolutely speculation, and it's silly for me to even bring it up. But it's possible that we're still going to have all of our Apple products designed by Johnny Ive. It'll just be from his own company. My guess, like if I had to guess, <laughs> it'd be that you know he's he wants to do passion projects. Um, and that probably means he wants to stretch beyond Apple. So he'll consult with it. But there might be 
a couple products that it makes sense for him to have a lot of input on. Like maybe he is still working, that his team's been working on the glasses and on the automotives for years. Like people years ago started getting designs on what, like what Apple cars could look like and things. So it could be that he still wants to really work on that. He said he wants to work on wearables and maybe some will be specific to uh, love from, but maybe some will also be in collaboration with Apple. So I think I think it'll he'll pick he'll just cherry pick you know that he'll like he'll cherry pick the things that he loves the most or maybe Apple's like we just need you there you know and you know we'll talk to you every once in a while and we're super happy that everybody is happy but we got this yeah it's sort of like sending your kid or or not off to college because that means they're going to come back someday but it's sort of like your kid moving out like you give them you know the the deposit so they can get their own apartment you pay for the deposit because they need a little. Yeah. Little help, and you're actually not that far from them. So if if they need you to send a little money here and there, or if they need you to wash their clothes for them when they come visit, you're there. You know, Apple is there to wash Johnny Ivy's undies when he needs <laughs> when he comes to visit for the weekend. But he's on his own, and yeah. you know, over enough amount of time, and vice versa. He's like maybe he's moving out and retiring because the kids, you know, the kids are getting the house because they can take care of it now, and he's getting a bachelor flat. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's also I, I, it's probably beneficial for both Apple and Johnny Ive in that you know he, he gets to leave and and pursue his passion projects, but Apple also needs to learn how to be without him too. So this is this is maybe a situation where he could have just been like, "I'm retiring and I'm never working again." Instead, it's sort of a a slow separation of the two so that he's still there he's still around he'll still be able to um you know help with design projects but apple will also kind of learn how to do do things on their own and grow on their own separate so you know i could see this kind of like starting out as almost not being that much different but over a short period of time they yeah. kind of grow separately and um apple needs johnny ive less and johnny ive needs apple less and until you know, there that that becomes kind of their own separate things, and and Johnny Ive can actually really retire and not worry about what's going to happen to Apple as a company. If iPhone twenty twenty four is super thick and has a bunch of dials and knobs on it, we'll know that it's it's the beginning of a new era. If Apple twenty twenty four is super thick and has a bunch of dials on it, it means that that's the way the world cultural world went. I mean, did you think? When we were getting smaller and smaller with our phone screens, did you think that there would come a time where bigger phone screens would be important? I remember, <coughs> excuse me, what a big deal it was that Apple made a 3.5 inch screen or, or I guess it was the four inch screen and maybe it was called the iPhone 3S or I can't even remember the details now. Well, the 3.5 was big at the time. It was one of the biggest displays you could make back then. People were used to like Motorola Razor flip phones and stuff. Well, yeah, I, touch touch screen versus uh, a non touch screen is a big deal. But I remember it was so it was such a big deal to have like this smaller phone. Those were important. And then now we flip the pages and we want our phones to be practically tablet size. So it, it's all about like what what changes in the future. And um, you know, the kids today, <laughs> they may be really into tactile things because they grew up with touch. Yeah. So to them, it's it's um, no, touch is no big deal, and they want knobs and buttons. <laughs> and, and if that's the case, then I I think that it would be, you know, that's where that's where I'm saying like it's good that Apple is growing outside of Johnny Ivy in terms of design aesthetic because would you know would Apple fail in that version of the future where everyone wants tactile buttons because there's one person who's saying no 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 that's that's no good we need to stick with you know what's this this specific design aesthetic. So being able to sort of roll with the future, I think is a good thing and and not sort of be stuck in the past. So, yeah, you know, yeah, I, totally. let's have our thick phones with big buttons in the future. <laughs> and with bell bottoms and hang glider collars. <laughs> Calling it now. It all comes back around. Uh, it, uh, all right, so any, any final Johnny Ive thought? I just want to wish everybody well. You know, thank you, Johnny, for 30 years of amazing. Absolutely. It could totally redefine consumer electronics. You won more awards and got more patents than most companies combined. And you made some of the most beloved products and some of my favorite, most iconic, most influential products 
Uh, and I wish both you and Apple's team super well with your endeavors and their endeavors. And, uh, Absolutely. I, I definitely know that my own personal taste in design grew the moment I started using Apple products. And I realized good, when I use products that aren't made by Apple, I realized the, the significant difference in my own personal opinion on the way they look. And I know that it was because of Johnny Ives aesthetic and, and what he did for the company that my personal taste has has kind of grown in that same way. And I find I find products that are not made by Apple to be frankly ugly. And I don't mean to put anybody else down, but so many times I've, yeah. I've come across very big companies that I think I just go, I don't want that in my house. That looks terrible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unless it's made by either Apple or the Corellian designers who made the Millennium Falcon, it's just not <laughs> worth looking. <at. laughs> well, actually, if the Millennium Falcon was made by Johnny Ive, it would look a lot better than it does. <laughs> it would look like Amadala's shiny ship. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, anything else you want to talk about, Lori Gill? There has been some other news, but none of it really st stood out to me too much this week. Yeah, so we actually haven't gotten a chance to um, drop a quick note about... Um, Harry Potter Wizards Unite. And I know this goes off, <laughs> off Apple subject a little bit, but <laughs> yes. But let me let me just uh, do a quick shout out to the sure. um, Wizards Unite. Um, it's a really fun game. Uh, anybody who's listening right now who is rolling their eyes because of how much coverage we had on Pokemon Go, uh, we're not going to kill you with with Wizards Unite. It's, it's just every once in a while I want to talk about it just because it's so fun. Um, it doesn't it doesn't yet have that same phenomenon feel that Pokemon Go had. I don't go out to the street corner and see 15 people at the end down the street like I did when Pokemon Go was was first out. Um, but what I do see is a lot of my friends are getting into this game that didn't really care for Pokemon, so they weren't excited about Pokemon Go. And I'm way more a Dumbledore than I am a Pikachu, Lori. Yeah, that's that's kind of the idea. And uh, Wizards Unite is a little more complicated than yeah. Pokemon Go was. And for people like you, Renee, and other people that I know that are big fans of Pokemon Go, they don't like Wizards Unite because it's a little more complex. But I've also found that people who were not huge Pokemon Go fans, maybe they were casual fans, or maybe they stopped playing a while ago, if they are Harry Potter fans, they love the way this new new version so is. I, I personally I be with you. So, like, my thing is, um, I declared Pokemon Go bankruptcy a while ago because there were just too many things. Like, I looked at a friend of mine is an accountant and she plays and she has a ledger every day of all the tasks she has to do, and it takes her like forty five minutes to an hour to just do like you have to do this many trades and you have to do this many spins to get everything that the game offers and it, it becomes like like work so i'm like i'm only going to do the events and i'll do like a, a few other things but i'm keeping it casual i don't need another day job and yeah. uh and, and there are other people who hate that they think the pokemon go is way too simplistic there's no depth they like the, the combat is like just mashing the screen and they absolutely hate it i'm the other way so like i've i've tried harry potter but it's it's a little too much like i just don't I would probably enjoy it if I didn't have a lot of stuff to do, but I have a lot of stuff to do. So I haven't been able to go too deep into it. So I like the casualness of Harry. I like the casualness of Pokemon Go. I think it makes it super accessible to like people playing with their kids, like young kids I'm talking about and all that kind of stuff. But I think Harry Potter is exactly what you said. It's going to find fans with people who do want more of a story, more of uh, more depth, more like things to do. So I'm glad that they sort of have different product. I, I would have hated it if it was just a thinly skinned clone of Pokemon Go. Yeah, and it definitely isn't. And and that's it, it's important to kind of like talk about those differences a little. Exactly what you're saying. Pokemon Go is fun for the whole family. Pokemon Go is something that you sort of take out of your pocket anywhere you're at. You do a couple of things, you're good. You're you're done. It doesn't. It's not very involved. And Harry Potter is more involved, but for different reasons. So with Pokemon Go, most of the time you have to sort of travel outside to get the, the to complete the task that you wanna complete. With um, with Wizards Unite, there's a lot of sort of internal things that happen, a lot of, um, uh, you know, potions that you're brewing and and um, herbs that you're growing and things like that, that, that don't have to take place outside. So you can kind of follow through a storyline right there in your house. You do still have to go outside 
a lot, but there are things that you can kind of maintain at home um, inside, you know, inside your house while you're waiting for the next time to go out. Yeah. Um, so it, it's certainly um, a big difference. Um, anybody who didn't really like Pokemon Go, but loves the, the world of Harry Potter should absolutely check this out because though it, there are a lot of similarities, you do have to go to inns and fortresses and, and greenhouses and collect things and battle things. Um, it's a, it's definitely a more robust version. There's a lot more going, a lot going on, a deeper storyline to follow, things like that. We do have um, an event coming up. It's, it's official that um, June, oh, sorry, July 3rd, the first Harry Potter Wizards Unite event takes place. Um, it's not a community event where people have to go to a certain location yeah. to, to see it. That's Labor it's, Day, right? That's That one's happening on Labor Day? It's, yeah, the Labor Day one is only, so far, is only in Indianapolis. Um, yeah. And that one is, uh, I think, September. Uh, but that's what they do. Like, Pokemon Go was only Chicago for the big one. It's sort of like they're, even though they've shown now that they can do it everywhere because they had to because of the <laughs> rain, but they, they like to make you travel. Yeah. Well, you know... I, as aside from the cost of having to travel, I know what it's like to be excited about a community of people. I go to Star Wars conventions and, you know, you don't have to, you could, you could have 800 Star Wars conventions, but, you know, Star Wars has- There's one. not some jerk running around going, Avada Kedavra, Avada Kedavra, like people just dying everywhere. It's just like, uh, <laughs> so messy. There's like force choking, light force choking between friends, but like there's no. <laughs> it's it's just a little light Patronum. force choking. Yeah. <laughs> so so being able to go to an to an event and have a community of people, I think is yeah. it's fun. It's a great idea. I I hope that they will do more around the country and not have like one focused thing that we if know, you want to go to it, you have to travel all the way to Indianapolis every year. But at the same time, I did literally travel to Indianapolis to go to a Star Wars convention. So I don't see that being that big of a deal if you can attend them, you know? Do we know if J.K. Rowling is playing? Have we heard? Do we know? That's so funny. I don't think she's like a level two. You know? asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that I would be find great if now. somebody ended up being friends with her, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> That'd be great. Okay, I, that's it. I just wanted to okay, sort of awesome. drop a note about Harry Potter and how much fun I'm having playing it. And um, I am not going to give out my friend code because I've done that once before and it ended up being atrocious. So sorry. So if it's the sorry same friend. thing as Harry Potter, <laughs> as if the same thing as Pokemon Go, you can actually reset it. So you can like, if you wanted to, you could give it out for a short period of time, then change it and then that's you know true. give it out later and stuff. So yeah. But anyways, Lori, if people want to follow you on social, if they want to see where you're playing, what you're doing, uh, anything else that comes up, where can they go? They can find me on uh, Twitter at Appleholic. That's A-P-P-A-H-O-L-I-K. I'm also writing all about betas, a little bit about um, Harry Potter, and everything else about Apple at iMore, and um, Lori Gill at most of the other social things. Not all of them, but most of them. We'll get them. It just takes time. <laughs> if Georgia what about you, Renee? You well, if Georgia was here, you'd be able to find her at Georgia underscore Dow on the rare occasions when the moon turns to blood that she actually uses Twitter still. <laughs> Otherwise, you can go to uh, anxiety-videos.com and see everything that she does to keep me and everyone else so successfully calm during the year. If Micah Sargent was here, you'd be able to find him at Micah Sargent, no underscore needed, or at chihuahua.com coffee for everything else. The man has like 900 podcasts. It's impossible to keep up with. So just go to chihuahua.coffee. Chihuahua He's got that golden voice. He's perfect. He does. Uh, yeah, that deep, deep, deep Micah Sargent voice. Mm -hmm. uh, and you can find me at Renee Ritchie on the socials, youtube.com slash vector, imore.com slash vector. Uh, I've got an hour long uh, Mac OS Catalina video, got a 10 minute long Johnny Ive video for you. And I also made my ultimate iPhone. If I got to be Johnny Ive for a day, I made the iPhone that I would <laughs> want. So check it out and let me know what you would want if you got to do that. Lori, thank you so much for joining me. What a treat. Renee, thank you so much for joining me. Oh, so much fun. All right, I, I thank all I would, of you, you beautiful, wonderful, <laughs> handsome, intelligent, empathetic, caring, considerate internet people that you are for joining us every week. And thanks to Jim Metzendorf for making us sound perfect. He does. We actually sound like chipmunks and he fixes us every week. <laughs> I every actually week sound like Darth Vader, so. <laughs> you do, and I sound like a chipmunk, so that's how much work Jim has to do. <laughs> thank you all, we'll see you next week. Thank you.